All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Deviant Mind. I'm Dominica. And I'm Christopher. I'm and sorry. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> We have a we have a great case for you today. It is James R. Jordan and his murder. And if uh, like I didn't know who James R. Jordan was, this was a case that Christopher had um, brought to the pod. He was the father of Michael Jordan. And if people who don't know who Michael Jordan is, he's what would you say one of the greatest basketball players of all time? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if yeah if not the best of all time, for sure. And I think he has shoes named after him, the Air Jordans. <laughs> shoes. Uh, you know, he was, there was literally at one point in the in the height of his career, he couldn't go anywhere or turn on anything without hearing or seeing him. You know, it was, I want to be like Mike. And tons of endorsements and Nike. And uh, it's pretty amazing considering his background and, uh, you know, he apparently yeah. was like a, a, a kind of frail little kid, but uh, yeah, amazing. The best athlete. In basketball yeah, he, exactly. And so this this case goes back to 1993, which is where his father was murdered on a county road <clears throat> in North Carolina. So but let's first, as we always do, find out who this victim was. Um, he was named James R. Jordan, the senior. He was born in Wallace, North Carolina on July 31st, 1936. He met his wife, Dolores Peoples, while attending Charity High School. And they stayed together through what seemed like most of high school for the next three years, where he soon after joined the Air Force and was stationed in San Antonio, Texas. He transferred to a base in Virginia in 1956, and he married Dolores very soon after. They had a son, James Ronald Ronnie Jr., that next year, and James Sr. left the Air Force and went to work in a textile mill. The Jordans had two more children, Dolores and Larry, during this time, and in 1963, James and Dolores left their children with James's mother and moved to Brooklyn so James Sr. could receive mechanics training on the GI Bill. He studied airplane hydraulics while Dolores worked at a bank, and this was during this time that Michael Jordan was born in Brooklyn. They moved back to North Carolina and reunited the family, and James finished his 18 months of training and moved his family to Wilmington, North Carolina. And Rosalind, their fifth child, was born there. James loved baseball, and he had almost gone semi, well, not almost, he had gone semi-pro himself. And Michael Jordan, in numerous interviews, spoke about how his father really wanted him to be a baseball star. And it was the first sport that James had taught Michael to play. Now, James was his son's biggest supporter and followed his son around the country as his fame grew. And in fact, Michael spoke about his father, that he was his closest confidant. And when his father was murdered, Michael Jordan actually quit basketball just two months later and went into baseball and tried to become yeah. a professional baseball player. I think he played in the minor leagues and like his father always wanted, but he ended up going back to basketball after some time. And I found a quote from Michael Jordan um, from March, 1996. And he said, quote, I think about him every day. I'm pretty sure I always will. And every day of my life, Un end quote. And his family never really has gone on record to talk about what the loss meant to them. They've kept it very private. When I was doing research, I, there was not much. Did you, what about you, Chris? That's absolutely a hundred percent that I couldn't find anything. Uh, mom was completely the word, you know, even at the time, uh, that you weren't, you know, no cameras were allowed, uh, during the service and things like this. Uh, I do know at the service, many of his, uh, uh, teammates and, and other, uh, players attended, uh, and it was a, a rather large service, but no, I've no, I don't know anything, or I have no records. I've read nothing uh, indicating nothing uh, about it. Of this, uh, passing affected them. Yeah, the and so and the way that yeah, the killing exactly. We have information on the killing, and it was a real strange one. Um, 
and that had lots of, as we've had in the last cases, it was quite convoluted and there were some really strange things um, that happened. And so, you know, he was found, his body was found draped over a tree limb um, on about, I think it was 10 days after he, let me Mm -hmm. see my notes. Um, Well, let's start from the beginning. Yes. If I may, he, uh, there, there is actually um, an appearance uh, by Jordan on the Oprah Winfrey show, and she brings it up, actually. I don't know how long oh, it is okay. after his father uh, was murdered, but mm-hmm. uh, he does. She asks um, if you were able to find, speak to them and ask them why they did this, would you? Mm-hmm. And he said, no, I don't even want to know why this happened. Uh, I don't. So basically, like he he was like, no, I want. He's like, you know, it's a great loss. He talks about missing his father and how close he was to his father. But then when mm-hmm. it came to, do you want to know why? What would you say to them? He was like, no, like I nothing to do with that. Yeah, just not interested. So yeah. what exactly happened to James Jordan? So two teenagers were convicted of his murder. Their names were Daniel Green and Larry Demery. They both got life sentences for first degree murder. murder. But there is a story and Daniel Green claims he never shot James Ward Jordan. It was actually Larry Demery and that he only helped get rid of his body. Now, so let's go back to that night of July 22nd. So what we do know was that James Jordan was attending the funeral of a former coworker in Wilmington, North Carolina. He was on the road going from Wilmington towards home to Charlotte on U.S. Highway 74. And from there, all the stories diverge because really there was no actual witnesses to what happened next. And his car wasn't even found in the place they claim he was killed. So he was found draped, his body, James Jordan's body was found draped over a tree limb in McColl, North Carolina in a swamp. And he was found on August 3rd, 1993. Whereas he actually died on the night of July 23rd, 1993. His car was completely broken down for parts and was not found on that Highway 74. His body was so badly decomposed when it was found 11 days later that it was hard to tell whether the body was a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And again, there's still a lot of questions of what happened. What we are going to give you is a timeline that the prosecution sold to the jury to get these two teenagers convicted. And really, only the killer knows exactly what happened. So this is what the prosecution in this case gave. So on July 22nd, 1993, as we said before, James Jordan was attending the funeral of a former coworker in Wilmington. On July 23rd, 1993, a bit after midnight, James left the friend's home in Wilmington and started heading home towards Charlotte on U.S. Highway 74. Shortly before 2 a.m. on July 23rd, James pulls off of Highway 74 about 800 yards west of I-95 in Robeson County. Now, there was some question about why he stayed in his car and not gone to the motel that was right next to that also um, you know, is uh the next day he was supposed to meet up with michael jordan uh mm-hmm. at a golf tournament ah okay so again expected, why is yeah he was expected to be somewhere uh to be somewhere yeah yes and and then again if he was tired and if he was sleeping and wanted to pull off i mean what the motel was open why didn't he just go get a bed for five hours and um Absolutely. sleep there versus he sleeping in the car he where he pulled off they say incidentally that he was uh drinking a little while uh at dinner mm-hmm. so they felt that maybe you know he was he was out of it and was like i just got to turn off here and at uh there is a uh, a stop like a truck stop where all the truckers go to rest uh on i-95 and uh, literally across the street from where he was was a hotel so the thing is, yeah. it's, 
You're Michael Jordan's So there's dad. a rest stop, and then there's yeah. a motel, and right. why are you stopping on the side of the road? Like, right. that totally doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Um, so James Jordan supposedly was shot once in the chest that night, and the teenage friends Daniel Green, and again, this is the story, and Larry Demery dumped his body in a, into a creek about 30 miles away near McColl, South Carolina, at they're thinking dawn maybe because at 7:05 a.m. on July 23rd a 2 minute phone call was made to a sex hotline from James Jordan's car phone and then at 10:36 a.m. on July 23rd 1993 Jordan's phone was used again to call Hubert Larry Deese the biological son of the Robson County Sheriff, who would later spearhead this case. On July 23rd, at 1047 a.m., Jordan's phone was used to call Green's half-brother, and this is Daniel Green, one of the teenagers. Then more calls came over the next couple of days that implicated Green and Demery, and that's how they were discovered by the police. On July 26, 1993, Green and Demery dumped Jordan's car in a wooded area in Fayetteville, and the car had been stripped. On July 30th, 1993, Green, this is Daniel Green, records a rap video wearing Jordan's NBA championship watch and 1986 NBA all-star ring, which he had given to his father. Yes, yes. And he must have either had them on him or were in the car. So on August 3rd, which is 11 days later, James Jordan's body was found in in the creek, like we talked about, but it was listed as John Doe. So he had not been, because again, the body was so badly decomposed, there was no identification made. On August 5th was when the police were notified of the stripped Lexus in Fayetteville. On August 7th, which is then four days after James James Jordan's body was found as the John Doe. His body was cremated by a South Carolina coroner as a John Doe Mm -hmm. because they had not made an identification yet. However, he had kept his jaw to see if he'd be able to use teeth to be able to identify him. And hand. Oh, he kept his hand too? Yeah. Okay. And uh, on August 12th was when Jordan's family finally... Uh, did a missing person report. And the moment that went through on August 14, he was finally identified through his dental records. Now, there was some question of why the family took so long to report him missing. I don't know. Did you, I found that he had a tendency to want to go off on his own. And so it wasn't rare for him to disappear for days. That's right. Um, did you, that's right. Okay. I found the same um, thing. He, he he was missing for over three weeks, right? Yeah. So yeah. that that's just nuts. But as to a testament as to his being kind of flighty, he changed plans a lot. Mm. You know, uh, he would schedule things, and then oftentimes he would break off uh, from I doing see. it. But uh, something uh, that needs to be said about this kind of crazy thing, and you know you have a lot of folks trying to figure while people were trying to figure out what really happened and who was responsible. uh, The things to keep in mind and some people went down that road was that Michael Jordan was a big gambler Uh, by all accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, Even in the uh, amazing documentary uh, about the Chicago bulls winning seasons, it's like a 10 parter. Ah, I'm blanking Mm -hmm. on what it's called. It's just amazing. But Even in that, uh, they show us how Michael Jordan would gamble on pitching pennies, who could get the penny closest to the wall. Let's play ping pong. He once gambled. uh, He told his uh, teammates, hey, you know, I bet you $500 my bag is going to come out first on the the luggage carousel. And so they all took him up on it, and his bag did come out first. And so he got everyone's money, but then he went and 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 paid the – one of the stewards or like the baggage carrier people to put his bag first. But so that <laughs> he, was, he was really into gambling and yeah. uh, he would gamble on golf a lot. Now, what's interesting is that at the, and his, I, I didn't get that much information on whether or not his pop was big on gambling. I mm-hmm. don't think he was, 
But it is interesting to note that the hotel, which is actually a, a quality inn across the street mm-hmm. from where he uh, rested, uh, went for a rest, uh, they, they were known to have gambling in the back. Like the people who worked at the hotel would often go into the back and gamble. Oh, which is why there's because I've because when I was doing research, I actually spoke to a friend of mine who had made a film about gambling. And she's like, when she was out down at the Commerce Casino, Mm -hmm. she said that everybody talked about Michael Jordan and his gambling problems and that they always thought that his dad's murder was somehow connected to that. That was kind of like the dark rumor, you know, right um, for the longest time. Uh, and then people use that to uh, explain why Michael didn't want to ever speak about it, why the family was so hush hush. Uh, right. And payback. maybe. Good. No, I was going to say because maybe that would have why they didn't look for him for three weeks and say he was a missing person. Like, you know, what I couldn't find anything. Yeah necessarily negative and we don't ever like to do negative about victims on this pod but just to kind of try to find like how he could have died in such Mm a horrible way outside of it just being completely really really bad luck of him being in this place um so he took that theory and ran with it uh yes this was some sort of payback that michael uh was in uh, deep debt and uh this is what they did but uh, as but as, just, we'll, as we'll see, it has it's actually nothing to do with gambling. Nothing to do it at all, and it was really just being at the wrong place at the right time to- at the wrong time. Yeah. Um, and again, like if he had just gotten to the motel or if he had gone to the rest stop, this would have not had happened. Yeah. Um, so the two uh the two men, and really they were boys. Larry Demery was only seventeen, and Daniel yeah. Green was eighteen. Um, they were soon arrested, and then it became by the police who was going to crack first, who was going to tell them the story first. And they both, um, both boys were offered, um, I don't think plea deals necessarily, but saying that this is a death penalty state. So they said, we'll take the death penalty off the table. Who's going to talk first? And who talked first was Larry Demery. And his story was that they had done several robberies that they had been caught for that summer, him and Daniel, and they wanted to do another robbery that night and that they found James sleeping inside his car and Daniel Green really wanted this car. And it was a 1992 red Lexus that James was driving that night and that he had a 38 caliber revolver that he'd stolen off of a robbery victim some months previous. Mm-hmm. He so this is Larry's story. He claimed that Daniel put the gun through the open window and somehow the gun went off. So it was kind of like an accident, like a robbery gone wrong. And then they went ahead and got rid of the body and stole the memorabilia and, you know, had their fun with the car before taking all the parts off of it. And that was the timeline that the prosecution went with for their trial. And he was granted um, the death penalty off the table. And the thing when I was researching it is that this story changed multiple times. Sometimes the door was open. Sometimes, you know, like he was awake because he claimed that he was napping in his seat. Sometimes he said it was awake and he rolled down the window. So it kept shifting. But none of that came on in on trial and Daniel Green has opposed the story he had has always admitted that he helped get rid of the body yeah and the car and, and, and stole the memorabilia the he took the and ring. he did to took yeah that he was, did to, but yeah yeah but he has maintained his innocence for the last 30 years and saying I did not kill that man I did not pull the trigger yeah. and there has been a lot of issues with the prosecution's case that has come out. Daniel Green has a uh, brand new attorney named, uh, what is her name? Mama. Christine Mama. Christine Mama, who she, um, I don't know exactly where she took over, but in 2018, she was really trying to get a new trial for him. And uh I found a fantastic article in the Chicago Tribune where he granted her, um, obviously, 
you know, he he granted the interviewer from the Chicago Tribune a um, an interview. I'm using interview a lot here um, to tell his side of the story because he never actually went mm-hmm. took the stand in his trial. That's but she right. always felt he made a really big mistake because he yeah, didn't he give the story. Wanted, he actually wanted to take the stand, and his mm-hmm. his defense team was like, "No, you shouldn't," and that hurt him so mm-hmm. much. So yeah. much. Um, and, you know, the crazy thing is now I saw that it was rescinded, but in two, 2020, they actually were going to parole Larry Demery to That's get right. out this August 2023, yep. and they pulled it. Um, I'm assuming maybe because of what you were telling me earlier is that he finally granted an interview with Christine Muma because the article that I found from 2018, he did not want to comment on the case. So mm-hmm. from that article and from the uh, court filings that I found online, there were definitely some issues with this case, which yeah. was, well, let's go into Daniel's story first. His story was that he was at a cookout party at his godmother's house at a trailer park and was hanging out with Demery and some other friends. That Green says that Demery left at 1.30 a.m. because he needed to take care of some drug-related business. Yeah. He invited Green to come with him, but uh, Daniel Green declined because he was hanging out with some girl. And he said that, and this also never came out in trial, but he had friends and family members saying that he was watching TV with them at the supposed time. I beg your pardon. That's what's crazy is he, he, most of his alibis took the stand as witnesses. Mm -hmm. Oh, he did. Okay. Because I wasn't uh, able to find the court documents for that. uh, But no, but it meant nothing. No, but they didn't believe them. They, it just kind of fell on, on, you know, on, on deaf ears. And the interesting thing uh, I found about this case was uh, it reminded me of the Dahmer case in the, in, in the, uh, the way race played a role mm-hmm. in all this. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robeson County is pretty, uh, it has its issues with race. There, uh, it's basically divided three ways. There are the whites, there are Native American Indians, and there are blacks, and mm-hmm. so there's base, and that's the hierarchy, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So blacks don't really mix with the Indians, and the whites don't mm-hmm. really mix with either one. But mm-hmm. what makes this case so crazy is that Larry and Daniel were really close friends since third grade, mm-hmm. which was unheard of. A, a black kid mm-hmm. hanging out with a Native American kid, and mm-hmm. uh, they were so close. Which is why, in in uh, in what I was able to to read and stuff was uh, about Daniel, was he just couldn't believe that he broke down uh, to the cops to get him in trouble? Because Daniel, the whole time while well, while being interrogated at the time, uh, m- you know, mum's a word. He wasn't. Yeah. He, he didn't. He refused to say that it was Larry. Yeah, and then and Larry did actually. Um throw him obviously under the bus because he, and that was one of the things in the article was that Daniel's like, man, if I could, I made so many bad decisions as a teenager because when Larry came back near dawn, I had never seen him like this before. The level of stress Mm -hmm. was just off the charts. And he's like, I had seen him being scared and stressed, but this was something completely different and that he begged him to help get rid of this body. And he had said that he had been involved in an altercation and he had shot a man near the quality Inn off of us 74 and I 95. Mm-hmm. And he's like, he was one of my best friends. He was like a brother to me. So I was like, okay, I got to help my brother out. And so they drove and he was implicated in helping get rid of James's body. Yeah. And, um, and, and yeah, and he still, I mean, obviously in interrogations, these are kids, 17, 18 year old kids. Yeah. Um, the cops from all I could see are like white, good old boys. So there's that already happened, that whole scary thing that's yeah. happening. And this is back in 1993. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, he's, point, I was just going to say at one point during the trial itself, uh, there is this really weird incident where, uh, one of the jury members requests to, to speak with the judge and Mm -hmm. the attorneys. So everyone's excused. 
except this uh, jury member who says that, oh, by the way, the jury, just like I believe in the Murdoch case that's happening, they were allowed to go home after every, mm. every day. And they all knew about this case mm-hmm. and they knew who these kids were. Like it's a tight knit community and everyone yeah. knows everything. Uh, so that's weird. You're off the bat. You already have a jury that's biased. And so, yeah. but so the, the, um, the trials interrupted by this uh, woman who comes forward and says, after we were released the other day, I overheard a fellow jury member on the phone uh, saying, yeah, I'm going to find him guilty. That N-word deserves to die. Oh, my God. Wow. So they set up. So the trial was at a standstill for a bit. uh, Mm -hmm. And they looked into this and there was an investigation. And uh, the supposed, you know, racist woman on the phone, the jury member, uh, denied it. And she stayed on the case. What? Yeah, she stayed in the jury box, but as an alternate. Wow. And then they proceeded. Wow. That's, I mean, (laughs) again, that's. You can look it up. Anita Hunt. Anita Hunt is the name of the woman who stopped everything, was like, I have to tell Mm -hmm. you what I just heard. Yeah. Yeah. But they No, and there was. And they just kept going. And there was definitely like some serious issues with the prosecution's case. Like yeah. I, they had no actual evidence. As I said, there was That's no right. witnesses. Yeah. There was very little evidence to um, essentially go along with the story that Larry Demery said. And, and the so car they was really, stripped. yeah, the car was stripped. And there was actually issues. There were two different issues. One was that the, um, the place where the car was processed was they actually, this case was part of a long list of cases where they said that they had messed up um, when they were processing it. And also the prosecution had left out from the jurors that they actually ran a lot of tests on the inside of the car and they couldn't really find any blood or gunshot residue because you know the story was that he was shot in the car and they had the state bureau of investigations a special agent jennifer elwell she testified at, that there were two chemical tests that suggested a pretty good indication of blood right but only in the back crevice of the passenger seat only in that back crevice but what didn't come out and i'm assuming the defense either messed up or never got this was that they did not disclose there were multiple other chemical tests performed on the leather in the front seat that were inconclusive for any detection of blood yeah or gunpowder yeah which was insane but when they um the uh reporters asked robson county district attorney johnson Britt, who was the prosecutor on the case he was like i'm not concerned and he's quoted in that chicago tribune article saying quote there was a lot of blood found inside mr jordan Britt said he bled internally so the fact that we couldn't confirm there was blood in the car is of little consequence really that was just one piece of the puzzle in a multifaceted case but like He's getting shot in the chest. Yeah. At close, you're yeah. gonna you're gonna find some sort of blood splatter inside that car. I mean, it's a completely closed environment. And as you know, when you're shot at close range, or or even from, you're gonna get you you get this splashback. You know, the blood. Yeah. Kind of goes everywhere. Uh, and gunpowder. Could you imagine gunpowder. the amount of gunpowder that should have been in that car? So incidentally, when uh, it wouldn't be until years later that they released the uh the results of those tests and they were all inconclusive Mm -hmm. exactly exactly and that was part of the thing that i found uh from the 2018 where she put in a lot of court filings trying to get a new court case for daniel green which did not happen because there was another there was like three big issues so the first one was the lack of blood inside the car the second issue was with james Jordan's shirt. Mm-hmm. So he yes. was wearing a collared knit Grand Slam pullover. And there was an issue with both where the bullet hole was found as all also with the chain of custody for yes. that actual sweatshirt. So first was the autopsy that was done on the John Doe 
that um, the coroner did, he stated, quote, there is no hole in the shirt at that point. Directly below that location in the lower abdominal region, there are three holes that would line up with the hole in the chest if the shirt were pulled up approximately one foot. So that goes against what the prosecution said and also that there was then a hole found in the upper right chest area of the shirt. And here's the other thing. The initial autopsy stated that there was no presence of gunpowder on the shirt. When the court case was happening, there was a, the agent was RN Mars. He was the one that testified and said that they found both the single hole in the upper right chest, as well as the presence of burned gunpowder around that hole. Mm -hmm. However, now this was before. So the autopsy was originally before James Jordan was identified. Now, there was a very strange chain of custody because of the lack of identification. Because he was a John Doe, after the autopsy, Sexton, the coroner, gave the pullover to an agent in the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. This agent, because it was a John Doe, Mm -hmm. passed the shirt, which I don't have no idea why he would do this, passed that to an employee of a company that provided services to funeral homes. Yeah. That employee gave the shirt to a superior, and because of how bad the, sh- the the sweatshirt smelled, they buried it in a bag outside the company's warehouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Buried it underground. Yeah. So you know, the Bureau of tree. Investigations had to, yeah, had to dig it up from the yard and took it, and all of a sudden there was a bullet hole found then. Mm-hmm. And the gun fa- on gunpowder, which, you know, Christine Moom is like, I'm sorry, but that sounds pretty good like evidence tampering. If the sweatshirt had none of this, no gunpowder and, you know, holes down at the bottom. Right. And now all of a sudden there's a hole exactly because then all of a sudden that fits Demery's story. Whereas before it didn't, because then why if he's sleeping in the front seat, why is his shirt pulled up a foot? Yeah. I mean, and how all, is the gun getting all the way down there to, right. to, I mean, it's just, yeah. All going to show that as soon as this all went down, uh, you know, once they took a look at that rap video, they were like, that's our guy, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think that they put more of the pressure probably on Larry than they did with Daniel to, you know, to come up with the story. To but come what up makes with it story. all really crazy is the fact that um, he, he go, uh, Jordan goes missing in his uh, – he goes missing in Robertson County, mm-hmm. North Carolina. Uh, the car is found in Marlboro County. So basically there are three different county agencies on this case. Mm. It's Robertson County, Marlboro County, and Cumberland County. I believe Cumberland mm-hmm. is maybe where um, – Oh, and so the swamp was well, his body was found in South Carolina, but then everything Uh, else. Yes, not North Carolina. Carolina. Right, right. So uh, there's so many like hands in the cookie jar and everyone's just kind of trying to figure this whole thing out. Also, going back to what we said, incidentally, uh, regarding the gambling. See, the people who uh, took to that theory claimed that Jordan retired uh, because uh, the commissioner said, look, your gambling is too much. You got to take a break. Like this is, this is not ah. good for the game. Like just step. This, I step see. This. Cause he did go back. He did. Re- he did return to the NBA. I believe two mm-hmm. or three years later, he, he came back. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I, it just seems to me that from the shirt, uh, to, the- and we haven't even gotten to the drug angle yet. Oh yeah. No, I, I it just, it's really wild. And, and the, uh, you know, initially there were four people uh, that they had in custody. And two of them, uh, I believe, served 10 years for stripping the car. Like they found that these two uh. guys, uh, you know, their only responsibility was that they were there to help. Uh, it's a Terrellis Ter- Teasley and a Duran Carter. Uh, mm-hmm. were both uh, responsible and and um, incarcerated for stripping the car. And they claimed they had no idea 
uh, that this was right. a murder. This was like they just thought it was like a stolen car or something. Right. Um, but there was a lot of corruption, as we also talked about uh, in this case, because yeah. if you remember, we were talking about a second phone call being made to a Hubert Larry Deese, who was the son of Sheriff Hubert Stone, who was overseeing the Jordan murder investigation. Now, Hubert Larry Deese was also a very close friend of Mark Locklear, who was one of the lead detectives on the James Jordan case. And the prosecution knew this. And Mark Locklear even admitted that Hubert Larry Dees was in his car. He mm -hmm. had done police uh, drive-alongs. Like, he was very close to the cops. Now, the prosecution had said, well, you know, he was an illegitimate son of Hubert Stone, and they really didn't have any relationship. Right. So it wasn't relevant. They would have never, like, you know, thrown the case. However, Mark Locklear said mm -hmm. that they never investigated that phone call and why Hubert Larry Dees was called he was the second phone call at 10.36 a.m. on July 23rd. So now who was Hubert Larry Deese outside of the son of the sheriff? He was a drug trafficker. And he also worked with Larry Demery at Crestline Mobile Homes, which was a trailer manufacturing company less than a mile from the swamp where James mm -hmm. was discovered. Now, he was arrested in February of 1994, and he was linked to a Colombian cocaine pipeline that was connected to New York and Lumberton, North Carolina. And he was later sentenced to 10 years for a single trafficking uh, count. Now, Daniel Green says that at the time, in 1993, Larry Demery was working as a mule in a, the Lumberton drug network mm -hmm. where Deese was near the top of the totem pole. Yeah. So there was now, none of this was brought out in the trial. None of this was brought out. The fact that Hubert Larry Deese was the son of the sheriff. And then about like five, six years, I think it was five, six years later, but there was 22 police officers that were found to be essentially they were indicted and arrested because they were part by by yes by Brit they were arrested for drug trafficking yeah. so this entire like police department was completely corrupt by completely. the drugs at this Utterly time corrupt. and, and so uh, the judge was the one by the way who shut down the defense wanting to bring up Larry uh, not Larry uh, Hubert they, they, for whatever reason, the judge was like, no, uh, it doesn't pertain to this case, which is But bizarre. he was the second phone call. But he was the second phone call from that car that judge was made went, that next morning. It, so the jury never heard it. And then the cops interviewed these, but they never recorded it. Ooh. They recorded every single interview with everyone involved except in this case, him. except for him. Well, because he was the son of the sheriff, and right. if the and if this and if the police station was so corrupt, and was essentially like letting all of this drug trafficking happen right underneath yeah. them, I'm sure getting kickbacks as well. So yeah, of course they were not going to record it. I mean, I my theory on this case is mm -hmm. that um, James Jordan, for whatever reason, saw some sort of drug deal happen between Larry. Demery and maybe Hubert Larry Deese or maybe the Colombians. Right. And he was given the order to like get rid of this guy because you're a mule. You fucked up. He saw this major drug deal go down. We yeah. don't know who the hell he is. Get rid of him. Yeah. And that's what he did because why would he call Hubert Larry Deese at 1036 in the morning? Like, why is that the second phone call? It does not, unless of course he's connected in that way. Because also, why would you kill a man? I mean, granted, yes, people kill people for much smaller things, but right. I feel if you are going for some sort of motive, then the drug angle makes a lot of sense to me. That he saw something he shouldn't have, Absolutely. and he got killed for it. Absolutely. Especially if you're dealing with the Colombian cocaine traffickers in 1993. Like, oh, oh my God. Yeah. No, it's just so deep and heavy. And uh, Robeson, this was a hot spot for drug trafficking. It really was. Uh, and he uh, apparently, uh, also according to Daniel, that night when, uh, you know, Larry leaves the place at like 1.30 a.m. Incidentally, mm -hmm. oh, again, uh, Larry had been living at Daniel and his mom's house, at Daniel's mom's house. Which oh. Is, which is also 
key because uh, key to the fact that in the beginning of this whole thing, they got a search warrant to check out Daniel's house and mm-hmm. they found the gun in the vacuum cleaner, in this vacuum cleaner, right? I see. Yeah. And it was Larry's gun, but they pinned it on Daniel because it was- But they pinned it on Daniel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, now, so as you, you said earlier, he he took that gun from a previous robbery or something like this. Right. Exactly. Because they yeah. had been actually, uh, they had been arrested and convicted of two previous robberies. So right. they were the perfect. I mean, it sounds like. Well, you told me that Christine Muma finally got Larry Demery to confess. Yes. Uh, so she uh, writes him, says, "I'd like to speak with you." Uh, he's hesitant, but says, yes, that's fine. Uh, they have this huge conversation about their upbringings, uh, and, uh, his relationship with Daniel. And then, uh, it basically turns out, you know, he admits, he he gets open and basically admits that he felt really, uh, afraid for his family, that he had Mm -hmm. been involved in so much stuff that if he didn't do what the police were egging him on, to do mm-hmm. to tell this story their version of the story uh that something would possibly happen to one of his family members while he was incarcerated and i uh, see and that as well as not face the death penalty uh, right he admits to her that he didn't that he killed uh michael jordan's father uh that he killed james and it wasn't daniel he said daniel was there or i mean daniel helped me but he had nothing mm-hmm. to do with the, the murder. That was With all. the actual murder. Now, so did he admit that it was because of a drug thing? Or did he just say, I I, I, I killed him? And not uh, really give the reason how? Doesn't go like, into did the he, reason. Did he give a new story? He doesn't, doesn't go. Does he like, go into no, the, a new story? No. He doesn't go into anything. No. But I what's see. interesting is she says, would you say, would you say this in court? And he says, yes. I will say this, I will admit this in court, right? Mm-hmm. So Muma tries to, you know, for years, Daniel's been trying to get a new case open based, you yeah. know, because that, it, the initial trial was just, it was an atrocity on yeah. all levels of law, of everything, everything uh, corrupt uh, as can be. But uh, they just keep denying. The state absolutely just keeps denying uh, his request. So that's when he he met up somehow with uh, Christine Moma has a big um, uh, she is a she has a great record of freeing innocent people who have been incarcerated mm-hmm. uh, for life or, or on the death death row. Um, so he got in contact with her and he had been while incarcerated reading a lot about law. He apparently would write um, statements for you know other people who were jailed and. Mm-hmm things like this. So she made it her mission to get him out of jail. And Mm -hmm. she kept trying and it was always denied. And she would state like, this has to be reopened because here's this, here's this, this was proven inaccurate. This never happened. And time and again, it's denied. And then, and then, you know, right now where we stand is she has to, or someone has to take it to uh, Carolina Supreme Court. I see. And so he, fact, uh, he's still in jail. Got it. Yeah. He's still in jail. And Muma is so dedicated to this that she um, ran for governor with wow. the intent that she could pardon him or finally, wow. you, know, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, she exactly. lost in the primary, but she tried, you know? But she tried. Yeah. yeah. So they are both in jail still. Yeah. They're, I believe, not up for parole for another couple of years. And um, Daniel just, you know, keeps saying, like, I I just want the truth to come out. I'm never going to stop because yeah. this, this isn't right. So it's and again, and it's such a tragedy because please, everybody do not pull off to the side of the road and go to sleep. <laughs> like It yeah. just seems, you know, being at the wrong place at the right time for whatever reason he pulled over. I mean, we don't really know if it, he did it to fall asleep. We mm-hmm. don't, nobody really knows what happened that night except for Larry Emery. And he's just not telling that story. Um, but it's fascinating to me mm-hmm. how one person's story could completely yeah. become the events 
that an entire court case, then everything is like supported to the story. But the story is just like one person's iteration. Like there's no fair, like, I mean, no or very little physical evidence to really give like a timeline of what happened between say, you know, one 30 in the Which morning was around 4 30 in the and morning. he comes back approximately. And when Danny morning, went to help uh, him get rid of the body. Wakes up Daniel's mom. So like that whole night's events, we don't that. know. Like he came home right. super late and uh, it was, everyone was like, what's going on? And then, you know, uh, uh, Larry was like, you got okay. to come with me. You should come with me. And then Daniel was like, all right, I'll go with you. You know, he, he didn't understand what was going on. Uh, Right. Right. I mean, that's drive. That's driving around. And yeah. So that's like a three hour, activity. three hours that I mean, nobody except for Larry but, knows. Uh, another what crazy thing from the trial, uh, like a big highlight was towards yeah. the end, yeah. they're giving their closing uh, arguments hmm. and the prosecutor, Britt, says, um, now you see, jury, this is, doesn't it tell you something that the... Uh, that our, uh, Daniel hasn't gotten to the box. He hasn't testified. And, and then all of a sudden the defense is like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's his constitutional right. So then the judge, they had to like stop for a moment. The defense wanted to, you know, they were pushing for a mistrial. You can't tell a jury yeah. something like that. Like, hey, he's got to be guilty. He didn't testify. No, that's your constitutional right. You don't yeah. have to testify. Yeah, uh, exactly. So they were they really wanted a mistrial. Uh yeah. But I, I think around that time, yeah. Um Daniel was kind of uh resolute and could see what was gonna happen. And from what I understand, he was just kinda like, No, it's okay. Like don't don't push for the mistrial. Like he knew what was gonna happen. And when he was uh mm-hmm. when he was sentenced, uh when asked if he had anything to say, he literally yeah. thanked Everyone. He thanked the jury for their time. He thanks the judge for his, you know, for doing his job. And it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. Now, look, this Daniel guy, he's no saint. As, as you mentioned, he yeah. and Larry both have this history and it's true. And uh, it's just a shame that there was yeah. never any room for either of these guys to sort of change their lives. You know what I mean? Or certainly Daniel. You know, I, I definitely, you know, Larry did this. So, you know, it's, it's a shame that Daniel, yeah. consequently, like we lose, yeah. uh, you know, two lives. You lose, you lose James, but you also yeah, lose Daniel's exactly. life. And he had the potential to change himself for better. But, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, just being like, hey, go to the police if he had an altercation, like, let's not do this. Let's not hide the body. I mean, there was definitely a lot of different choices, yeah. which he says now is there's could have been so many different choices that I could have made instead of getting rid of this body. And he's like, that's on me. I should absolutely go to jail for that. Like he fully takes responsibility of what an awful decision yeah. he made. Um, but I mean, again, he's in for first degree murder and that is something that he did not do. So, um, that was the case of crazy James Jordan time. and crazy uh, racial yeah, divides. Just, again, just seems I mean, like a kind of wrong place at the wrong storm. time, and just but a huge thing of justice. Happened. You know, I think it's important that listeners understand yeah. that it's you know don't go down any other routes. You know, I think myself included. Like before, uh, we we focused on this case. I I assumed yeah. that it was definitely something. Uh, maybe mafia gambling related for sure, for sure. I think everyone does. So it's 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 important that folks know to do with the gambling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Instead, he kind of really kind of just was thinking of that the TV show with uh, Jason Bateman in it. (laughs) Like he stepped into. Like uh, the 1993 version of um, oh right um, crap. What, what is that? What is that Netflix yeah, show it's called? A, it's a place. Um, with the with the drug running. I can't think of any th- any titles today. The bird and the yeah the laundry. 
with, with, with the birds. Who, who's Marty Bird? The Michael Jordan documentary is incredible. I can't remember that. I can't remember the title of those things. <laughs> the, anyway. Ozark. Yes. <laughs> 